Hi, my name is Jonathan Zapp, and I'm very honored to be at a um, first time speaking at a near-death society. Um, a lot of my work is very centrally related to near-death experience, and I'm honored to be among people that, have, that possess such gnosis and intuition from having had, I assume many or most of the people here have, have probably had near-death experiences. So um, <clears throat> those people are um, aware of another level of things, and I'm hoping that that's going to make the talk a little bit easy, easier than it might be um, to those who haven't had such an experience. And every time I, I talk about this subject, I sort of wonder if I should talk about my personal experience and how I got into it first to give it a slightly more grounded personal way in, um, or what is also kind of burying the lead, or to talk about what archetypes are and give kind of a, um, a miniature of uh, what the um, singularity archetype is about. I think I'm going to go with the personal. I decided not to speak from an outline today um, to make it a little more organic. Um, <clears throat> so I, I did not have a near-death experience exactly as a child, but I had many paranormal experiences, and I sensed that there was some kind of vast connection between many of them and also of many objects, cultural objects, um, such as science fiction movies, novels, um, that had this uncanny significance, what Jung would have called um, numinosity. Numen means spirit. So something is numinous when it lights up as having this uncanny experience. And of course, uh, a near-death experience is, is almost you know, the definition of a numinous experience. And, and um, <clears throat> uh, However, I found that sometimes it was even a science fiction movie um, or a novel that was as numinous to me as some of my own paranormal experiences. And so uh, by the time I was 19 and a junior in college, I, I had a couple of successes of following a path that I call the path of the numinous, and that's a, an essay and a podcast on my website as well, um, that's basically about just going down the rabbit hole with anything that strikes you as um, incredibly uncanny and significant that you don't understand. And so um, after having a couple of successes with that, when I could finally do some independent studies in the academic environment, uh, by my senior year, I decided to tackle something that I thought would be incredibly difficult because it would relate to all these paranormal experiences I had. And I was in a very highly conservative um, college. And uh, um, I didn't really know where to begin in understanding why, for example, a science fiction movie called Village of the Damned, made in 1960, black and white, um, had an effect on me. I watched it on a black and white television in full daylight with my dad, and it had an effect on me almost like a religious experience. It's not really clear why. It's not like it had like obvious sexual content or something that you would expect to create some extremely strong reaction. Um, I also found when I read the novel Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, written four years before I was born, that um, that too um, was uncanny because many of the ideas in this novel um, were ideas that I had futuristic visionary ideas that I had, and here it was in this book written four years before I was born. How was that possible? So it was actually my mom who gave me my first hint. Uh, she was a psychologist for 44 years, and I just called her on the phone and uh, telling her about this big project I was about to embark on, and she said, <clears throat> well, you know, you really should look into this guy Carl Jung and his theory of the archetypes and the collective unconscious. And that was the first lead that anybody gave me about a, an academically respectable way to investigate these strange subjects. So I went up to the second floor of the college library, and there were the impressive Princeton Bullingen collected works of Carl Jung. But I was, I was kind of skeptical, you know, this, my mom told me to look at this, you know, this guy reached manhood in the 19th century. I mean, what is he going to tell this weird kid from the Bronx about his sci-fi obsessions? But I pull out, there's an index volume, I pull that out, and I'm just, oh wow, he wrote a book called Flying saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the sky. Well, that's a direct hit because, you know, Village of the Damned and Childhood's End, they all involved um, 
flying saucers. So he was studying science fiction too. And I see he was writing about this right near the end of his life. And so I start flipping through. This is my first encounter with Jung. At, at that time, I was pronouncing it Jung, you know. Um, and I see, you know, he, it's like he couldn't let go of the subject because at the end of it, there is an epilogue. And then after the epilogue, there's an afterword. And then the very last thing in the book is a supplement, a third after thing. And now my jaw drops open um, because it starts with another recent book, a novel by John Wyndham called The Midwich Cuckoos, 1957, the year I was born. Well, that was the novel that the movie Village of the Damned was based on. So, you know, here he is, the father of synchronicity, the man who coined the term. And my first encounter with him, he might as well have been a holographic wizard stepping out of the bookcase with a torch saying like, yeah, I was interested in that one too, and here's what I thought. Um, and what was amazing was that my starting point um, was his end point. This was, you know, uh, the, the end of a book that he wrote very near the end of his life. And he, he's, you, he's completely puzzled uh, with it. I mean, many of the things he thought paralleled some things that, that I thought about it. And it was, he, he left it. I mean, think about this as a way to end a book. Here's the last sentence of this book. Thus, the negative end of the story remains a matter for doubt. What an ambiguous way to uh, end a book. I mean, uh, um, and he, he was wondering why, wh wh what was the meaning of the end of the story where the, the, the new mutant children had to be destroyed. And, you know, I feel I found out it's because the, the ego views the singularity um, and evolutionary metamorphosis as catastrophic, um, whereas the self views it in a very different way. And, and it's the same thing with, with death. The ego views it as emergency, and the self may view it as emergence. But anyway, now I'll stop bearing the lead, and we'll, we'll proceed a little bit more logically and first talk about what archetypes are uh, for those who may not be completely familiar, and then we'll go on to talk about what the singularity archetype is. So archetypes are a thing that are often misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, classic examples of the archetype are the hero, the trickster, the great mother, uh, the devil. Um, and these are not merely patterns or like cultural motifs. They are that as well. Archetypes are best understood as living agencies. They are best understood as entities that exist in the collective field of human unconscious. It's, you know, uh, the way Jung described it as translating English is the collective unconscious. It's, it's basically the same thing as what Rupert Sheldrake called the morphogenetic field or the morphic field. And um, they can be said to have their own intentions and a kind of consciousness. And uh, what's also critically important is that they form us. Um, you know, they are not merely objects we can study, they are subjects. And um, at any given point in someone's life, they are often dominated, for good or bad, by a particular archetype. So, and, and these archetypes, their existence is a matter of empirical proof. Because uh, as Jung and his colleagues demonstrate, <clears throat> these are uh, very specific patterns that occur in any culture, separated by any amount of time or geography. And, and no one has come up with a, a way of explaining them other than um, a collective unconscious. And, um, <clears throat> and so um, as living agencies, um, they have a tremendous power to form who we are. We, as Americans, as Jung understood, live in a very extroverted society um, that has become really increasingly unpsychological. Uh, because if you look at what's happened to depth psychology and how the psychology um, in taught in colleges and universities has become extremely reductive and unpsychological, it's almost you know em embarrassed to call itself psychology. It just sees itself as like an auxiliary to neuropharmaceutical and uh, neuroscience and so forth. And so uh, um, this idea of the primacy of psyche is something that is easily missed. And yet it is the chief mover of our whole experience. You know, uh, if we're talking about warfare, 
anything related to the economy, violence, environmental destruction, these are 100% psychological artifacts. Okay, these are all sourced from the psyche. And what is governing the psyche are primordial forces from the collective unconscious um, that create the whole spectacle of history, for example. So as, as Jung said, um, you know, um, there is no hydrogen bomb in nature. That is all man's doing. Uh, we are the great danger. Psyche is the great danger. Um, Jung was working as an analyst in the Weimar Republic um, and noticed that his educated German patients were having dreams about Wotan, a Ger uh, Germanic god of war and mayhem. And he wrote about this. He called it Wotanism. He predicted that a blonde beast was going to bubble up from the unconscious of the German people and, and wreak havoc. And so, <clears throat> um, you know, when we're talking about what's going on in the world today, um, like the election of Donald Trump, who is a personification in many ways of the trickster archetype and so forth that breaks through expected hierarchies and um, you know um, does unexpected things and and so forth um, I've written a lot about this recently uh, you know we are talking about um, an emergence uh, from the collective unconscious um, eco economists even acknowledge this that that you know they tried to come up with theories about economics based on rationality and people doing things based on their self-interest and they found out they didn't hold up it so that you know uh, top economic theorists talk about animal spirits so uh, these archetypes um, are, are powerful governing forces out of which war cultural rebirth and all kinds of things um, emerge on the collective and on the individual level so uh, when I um, started looking into this in 1978 when I was 20 years old. Um, I, I wrote a paper, a philosophy honors paper called Archetypes of a New Evolution. And basically I discovered an archetype, an archetype that was not properly recognized. Now, interestingly enough, it turns out that um, there's a co-discoverer, which is a great relief to me that I'm not the only crazy one. And so I have some validation and I actually found out about this co-discoverer, his name is Michael Grosso, through NDE research. It was reading a couple of um, Dr. Kenneth Ring's books um, that are most related to the singularity archetype, Heading Toward Omega is one of them. Um, and he, he quoted uh, Michael Grosso a lot, uh, uh, a uh, philosopher with um, a Jungian background like myself. And I've been in touch with Michael. He started writing about it in the 80s. So I did publish something first, um, but he calls it I call it the singularity archetype, it, type. he calls it ADE, the archetype of death and enlightenment. But we both agree we're talking about the same thing, and it, we both relate it to near-death experience, death, evolution, paranormal experience, ufology, all the same subjects. And um, so the, the singularity archetype, um, I believe, is the governing agency that structures the near-death experience. It relates to two great parallel event horizons, death from the individual and eschaton or quantum evolutionary event for the species. And these two run in parallel in the way that um, a fractal or hologram, the small piece recapitulates the whole. The life cycle of the individual recapitulates the life cycle of the species. There used to be this phrase that's somewhat discredited now, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, because you'd see in the development of a fetus, it would go through a, you know, a kind of one cellular looking stage and then a tadpole looking stage and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I understand that doesn't fully hold up anymore, but we see in the life cycle of the individual um, uh, a parallel to the life cycle of the species. And species have a life cycle. The average life cycle of a species is 100,000 years. For mammals, it's a million years. Right now, we're lowering the average dramatically by, by you know, the mass extinction that's going on now. Um, but um, human beings have been obsessed uh, from time immemorial. Apparently, you know, it was, it's certainly in Zoroastrianism. Some say it may go back to the late Paleolithic. 
with an end time obsession, apocalypticism. Apocalypticism, every archetype has a light and dark side. Apocalypticism is the dark side of the singularity archetype. Because the singularity archetype, like the event horizon of death, may be seen from the ego point of view, that we'll see it as apocalyptic, um, or it can be seen from the point of view of the self, what Jung called the self, the totality of all the psychic structures, which will view it as an emergence, as a quantum evolutionary event on the personal level or on the collective level for the species. And so um, I'll start out, I'll give you a little bit of a formal definition of it, um, and then I'll give you some examples to try and, and ground that. So this is a kind of very dense but formal definition of it I tried to come up with. But let's understand, first of all, why um, defining an archetype too sharply doesn't exactly work. Um, it is, these are living entities that um, exist not just outside of us, but within us. And um, you, you, basically the Jungian method is to look at many, many different permutations of it, many manifestations of it in various cultures and times. You strip away idiosyncrasies peculiar to any one manifestation that may be just because of the cultural biases or the religious conditioning of that culture, and, and now see what they all have in common, and you're sort of cleaning up the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and so, uh, for example, Joseph Campbell wrote a book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, because the hero uh, cycle is, uh, has the same patterns and stages in any culture you care to look at. And so he's being numerically modest when he said a thousand faces. Of course, it's more like a billion faces. And it's also like the kid next door. Um, you know, maybe going through the hero cycle right now, the call to adventure, the refusal. Um, you know, we, we, you can probably look back on your own life or you might be in a phase right now of going through that, those same stages. Um, and so when you, but when you look at it, you need to look at it as many examples as possible. Um, way back in the day, I was a gemologist and a diamond grader and we'd have to like, you know, try and... Um, uh, look at a diamond under a microscope and, and, and try and make a little map of the carbon inclusion and so forth. But the problem is you'd look through every facet and each time you're seeing this prismatic distortion, so it's like a different cubist painting of it from all these different angles, but you look at it from enough angles and you start to get a clearer and clearer I idea. And so that's what it's like um, with looking at an archetype. Um, you're, you're, you're seeing it through many different facets and until it starts to become clearer in your mind what it is. Um, <clears throat> but, so here's the dense definition. The singularity archetype is a primordial, Im primordial image of human evolutionary metamorphosis which emerges from the collective unconscious. The singularity archetype builds on archetypes of death and rebirth and adds information about the evolutionary potential of both species and individual. Well, there's a thousand flaws with that definition, I'm afraid, but um, just to try and put it in one sentence for you. Um, <clears throat> um, but here, here's how it might be experienced. Now, the way somebody could experience it <clears throat> is um, it could be a vision of the future that might come to a science fiction writer or somebody who feels they've had a religious prophecy. It can be as a near-death experience, and everything that are in the futuristic visions of what may happen when we cross an evolutionary event horizon are phenomenological actualities in the near-death experience. So a, a, a form of visual telepathy, um, a, um, a breakdown of um, ego boundary versus the collective, um, a, a transcendence of linear time, all these things happen in near-death experiences. So they're not just futuristic images, um, they're actualities. And so um, people also encounter the singularity archetype in dreams, um, in hallucinogenic experiences, a lot of ufological experiences and abduction experiences um, are, seem to be governed by it. Um, Dr. Kenneth Ring pointed out um, in some of his books, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Connecticut, most of you guys have probably heard of him, he's one of the great pioneers in NDE research, um, the incredible parallels between um, ufological experiences and near-death experiences. And, and he relates um, 
near-death experience to future evolution as well. And so um, one of the ways that this can appear um, is a rupture of plane event, a shocking event, um, which may threaten the survival of the individual, like cardiac arrest, or of the species, like um, an apocalyptic scenario in somebody's imagination, perhaps. And, uh, and when this rupture of plane occurs, there may be a kind of a stereoscopic view. Depending on the manifestation of it, we may see only one view or the other. The ego will see it as apocalyptic, catastrophic. The self will see it as a quantum transcendent evolutionary event. And um, <clears throat> when, if the transcendent aspect is revealed, um, it will often involve spiral motifs. The spiral is an evolutionary symbol. Um, unusual lights, eyes. And there will also be a um, consciousness and communication, both metamorphose, so that um, a, uh, a form of tele telepathy happens, and so often happens in near-death experience. Um, and one sense of ego and individuality is radically altered. Just like in a life review, people may be experiencing the same event, but through the points of view of others to see how they were affected, um, and not just from your individual point of view anymore. Um, and other things that will radically shift are things like corporate, one sense of corporate reality, gender identification, social order, etc. Um, and just as we know from near-death experience, people come out of them, what seemed small may in their life review be suddenly revealed as incredibly significant, and things that they once valued as highly significant are now revealed as small. Um, <clears throat> there will be... Um, Emergence of, of glorified bodies. That's a major section in, in the book. Um, in the futuristic versions of it, these could be because we've merged with computers or because of some other evolutionary mutation of spontaneous mutations, um, <clears throat> like the X-Men or something like that. Um, in in um, near-death experience, that actually happens. Somebody who may be incredibly myopic may discover that they have 360 degree plus spherical vision with incredible visual acuity where they can count the hairs on the surgeon's head. So, I mean, this is like a sci-fi movie where, you know, you have a mutant that discovers they have a paranormal ability in the near-death experience. This actually happens. And we also know from some of Dr. Pim Van Lummel's um, studies, uh, the first prospective studies about near-death experience, that people have lasting paranormal effects after the NDE, and we can get into some of those uh, later. Um, <clears throat> and, and so um, the NDE may be, the singularity archetype might be encountered as a dream, vision, fantasy about eschaton, or through, um, you know, some of these other means I talked about, um, also OBEs and Kundalini experiences. And what happens is when an archetype is contacted by anybody, it filters up through the personal unconscious of that person and then also their waking consciousness, which may heavily distort it. So, you know, if you're an evangelical Christian and an entity of light speaks to you telepathically, you may interpret that as Jesus, and somebody from another culture may interpret it differently, or an atheist may interpret it as Jesus too, because that archetype is out there in the collective unconscious, and, and uh, it may get uh, um, present to them that way as well. <clears throat> um, all right. I think it's time to move on to some examples. And we'll start with a couple of really simple ones, and then move on to some more complex ones. And just remember that each time we're looking through a different facet, and we're going to try and keep spiraling around until it becomes clearer and clearer in your mind. So um, the first one is a dream that a uh, uh, young guy told me at a, a festival, you know, maybe 15 years ago or something. He, he uh, in his dream, was walking out in the forest, and suddenly the sky became extremely black, and um, it, it felt like an earthquake. It felt like the earth itself was being shaken to pieces. It seemed totally apocalyptic, like the end of the world. <coughs> and then from this dark canopied sky, um, suddenly there's a break in the clouds, um, and so a beam of sunlight breaks through this dark canopy, 
and he looks up at the sunlight and there is an eagle with a golden egg in its talons and the eagle comes spiraling down and deposits the egg on the top of the tree. So um, there you have like the two pieces of it. Um, from where he's standing, at first it seems apocalyptic and then the higher version, um, a ray of light, an eagle, um, which has the best animal, that has the best eyes in nature, and the golden egg, which seems to, you know, you can see it as a symbol of a new golden age and of rebirth. Okay, um, slightly more complex one now. This one um, comes to us from a book called Man and Symbols, a book that Jung and his colleagues wrote right near the um, end of Jung's life. He was working on his part of it. Um, there he is, Carl Jung. Um, uh, in the last months of his life, right up until the day he died, practically. So it's a great sort of mature summing up the part that he wrote. But one of his greatest colleagues, Marie-Louise von Franz, um, <clears throat> recorded a couple of dreams. This is one of the first um, discoveries I made when I was 20 years old. Um, <clears throat> she uh, recorded two dreams by what she described as a naive or simple Protestant woman. And, and I assume Swiss, because that's where they were working out of Switzerland. In the first dream, um, the dreamer, and the dreamer draws paintings of them. This is sort of like a paper PowerPoint presentation. Um, but you can see that the dreams, maybe I'll just pass the book around. Um, in the first dream, uh, she's standing in the Middle East. She draw, paints pyramids with, with a spirit guide. And the dark wing of Satan comes out of the sky and blots out the sun and touches the earth. And she's terrified. It's apocalyptic, you know, um, seen through a somewhat Christian lens. <clears throat> and by the way, I think of what, when, when religious people, um, you know, who are, who are uh, very fundamentalist religionists, see the singularity archetype, it's sort of like looking at it through stained glass windows. Now, I happen to love i got some nice ones here. I have a lot of stained glass windows in my house. I love them. But as far as getting a clear view, the segments of lead solder and the you know oxidized glass um, kind of pre-structure what you're seeing. Um, so it, you, you're, you're getting an image of it, but it's very determined by cultural conditioning. So I, I try to look at it from a, a non-denominational uh, point of view. Um, in her second dream, she's seeing the same event. But now, instead of being on the earth, she's up in the heavens. And what looked like the dark cloak of Satan is now revealed to be the white wafting cloak of God. She draws a white spiral of light in the sky. And the way von, and von Franz describes the spiral as being oriented in such a way, because she also draws a figure of Jesus reaching his hand out as if inviting the viewer into the spiral. Um, von Franz says it's oriented in such a way that it seems to be inviting the viewer into another dimension. So here we see the same thing again. The ego point of view, apocalyptic. The higher transcendent point of view, quantum evolutionary event. And again with the spiral um, as a symbol. And that's why the, the uh, I chose for the cover of my book um, an eye at the center of a spiral. Um, and this comes up uh, again and again as a symbol. Now, oddly enough, a couple of years after I published this book, I had to clean up my parents' estate, basically, a, a house of four floors in the Bronx. It was like an Indiana Jones warehouse type of thing. And I found these paintings of my dad. He only painted for like about five years of his life. Like he had a period from like 1952 and 1953 and another one from like 1977 to 79. I started going through these paintings. I, I was shocked that like the same year that I was writing about the singularity archetype or starting in 1977, a lot of his paintings had many of the same singularity archetype motifs. Now, maybe in 1978, he would have read my paper, though some of them were, were dated before that. But then I discovered in the attic a painting from the 1952 period. And there's an eye with a spiral on it. And then you see all these sort of lines of force coming out of a book with spirals, you know. And, and, and for me as a writer, um, the place for me to connect with the singularity archetype is 
writing and books, um, especially I found that fantasy writing um, allows for a more direct connection for me. I realized this in 1978. I'm still working on the fantasy epic um, <clears throat> than, than approaching it from the more left-brained scholarly perspective. <clears throat> um, okay. Let's go to a, a more complex version of the singularity archetype. So we got one from like uh, a young guy at a festival. We got one from a simple Protestant woman um, who obviously had religion in her background. Now we're going to look at it from the perspective of a famous atheist astrophysicist, Arthur C. Clarke. Um, in 1953, four years before I was born, he wrote a novel called Childhood Zen. This was one of the other highly numinous cultural artifacts that got me on the subject. So in, in Childhood's End, um, it's the world sort of somewhat of his future, um, and uh, UFOs appear around the planet. And they break through all the communications, and they announce, um, you know, we're here to help you uh, through a critical stage in your evolution. You can call us the overlords. Um, we are um, not going to interfere with your free will um, unless you are going to do violence to each other. And um, as of that moment, through some technological prowess, um, and they, any, any type of weapon fired is returned to the sender, whether it's a nuclear missile, an artillery shell, or even a bullet. So all violence, you know, unless with knives or something, becomes impossible. And, you know, and then they say, basically, we're, we're here to help out. One oddity, though, um, that some people find a little bit disturbing is that they, is that they will not land or physically before, appear before human beings. They say they won't do this for two generations, 50 years. And people wonder, well, they must look like jellyfish or, or you know, giant insects. So they, they, they're afraid to, to gross us out or something. So 50 years go by, and it's a time of, it's a golden age of prosperity. Um, because they provide all these medical advances and, and, and so forth. Um, and now, finally, they, they do decide to land. And um, the spaceships descend. It's a huge moment. And now they step off of the craft, and there is a, you know, a gasp you know, heard around the planet, metaphorically, because... They have giant black ebony wings and they have horns and tails and like cat-like eyes and they look like um, devils. And, um, uh, and, and this is fascinatingly incongruous in the world of futuristic technology of 1950s sci-fi written by an astrophysicist atheist. You know, here is, here is an archetype descending, the devil, seemingly. Um, and uh, Clark has a fascinating way of describing it. He, he says it's a race memory of a future event. They are not, in fact, evil at all. They are exactly who they say they are. They're, they are benevolent midwives, basically, here to help us through a critical evolutionary stage. But their physiognomy, which, from the point of view of the novel, is just the evolutionary adaptation to the environmental conditions of their planet, is associated with evil deep in the human unconscious because it is childhood's end. It is the end of the old species. And um, a, an event associated with a trigger event of the birth of a new form. And um, <clears throat> so now the overlords are free to um, mingle um, amongst human beings. And uh, they are immediately want to research paranormal phenomenon. And so one of the overlords, whose name is Reshevarek, um, you know, is, gets himself invited to the home of a man who has the largest privately held collection of books on the paranormal. By the way, as a trivia question, does anybody know um, what uh, celebrity um, had the largest library of books on the paranormal? Gabe? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. He was also somebody rumored to have been, um, and and this Jack is even Gleason? exactly the man who, um, uh, according to Jackie Gleason's widow, the man who um, Richard Nixon took on a private trip to see the body of frozen aliens said. 
Anyway, <clears throat> so he goes to this, the home, and um, it seems like the description of the people there seems like a prophetic anticipation of narcissistic New Age people of the present era. It's like they've shown up for the celebrity name-dropping um, appeal of getting to meet an overlord, you know, which very few people have gotten this privilege. And when Reshevrek speeds re speed reads, you know, this alien super capability, um, <clears throat> this library, you know, he, he kind of like sighs at like, you know, how, the, the large amount of nonsense that's mixed in and the, and the mysticism that plagues the human mind and, you know, so much of this material is of low quality. But, you know, he, he, he's going to go along anyway and they start having, you know, what seem like new age entertainments. Like one of them is going to be a session with the Ouija board. And so he's, he observes this and they ask the Ouija board the classic question, who are you? And the plan shut spells out I A M A. L, L, I am all. So it sounds like the collective unconscious announcing itself. The next they ask, well, what are the coordinates of the overlord star information they never disclosed? And it spells out the correct coordinates. And so now Reshevarek believes that um, he's found what they've been looking for, uh, which is what they call subject zero. And this is kind of like Clark's um, atheist version of a messiah, basically, uh, almost, in that it's sort of like a key mutant that'll be like a seed crystal whose appearance will then shift everything after. Um, and he concludes that they must be present. I, I guess he's naive about how common paranormal experiences are, but, um, <clears throat> but yet he looks around the room and all the people seem to be fairly mediocre, um, but it turns out one of them is pregnant and it's her unborn fetus that is subject zero. And when this baby um, is born, it immediately starts exhibiting all these incredible paranormal abilities. And then, like a seed crystal, all of the children born after his birth are similarly of this new type. And they quickly form a telepathic network. This is also what happens in Village of the Damned. Um, new children are born, they form a telepathic network. And, um, and at, at some point in their evolution, they just translocate all to one continent and join hands in what's called the long dance, which I've always seen as like spiral, spiraling together. I don't know if it's quite described as a spiral. And then, um, uh, then after a certain critical number of these children are born, the species becomes sterile, hence the title Childhood's End. Uh, there's no need for the old species to reproduce. And now... Um, <clears throat> We flash forward many decades. What's, what's happened is that one human being has managed to sneak on board one of the Overlord's ships. And now, um, because of time dilation, he travels with them. And now when they bring him back to Earth, it might be 80 or 100 years later or something. And they want to bring him back to Earth because they want him to observe the final stage of the, the this new... This, these new children's, you know, ev uh, evolution that they can still observe, which will be their merging with the overmind. And this is kind of um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke's atheist God concept, that there is an intelligence ubiquitous in the universe that's aware of when a species has reached a critical point in its evolution. And that's why it sends the overlords there to act as midwives. Uh, remember the name of the novel that um, Village of the Dam was based on, The Midwitch Cuckoos? Sounds like midwife. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the overlords are themselves barren, as they describe it. They are much more advanced species ethically, technologically, and consciousness in every way, but they are unable to have this critical um, metamorphosis themselves, and that's why they, they forever act as the midwives of this process. So the overlords know that their vision of this event might be limited because their own species is limited. So the one human being of the old type left, who's still a young man because of time dilation, is brought back to Earth to observe these children crossing the event horizon in the ultimate observable stage of their evolution. And to him, what it looks like is an aurora borealis, a spiral of light in the sky. Okay? The same as in the dream of the simple woman. The wing of Satan she sees coming down, blotting the sun. 
That's what we get in the first part of the novel. You know, when the, the overlords land, they have the, the wings of Satan. And then the quantum evolutionary view, a spiral of light in the sky, inviting us into a different dimension of evolution. Um, <clears throat> the most striking example of, of the singularity um, archetype um, uh, that I could think of. Let me show you one more image. Um, you know, a, a big part of the singularity archetype is what I call homo gestalt, and that is where we have a or new organism um, in which there's a, a telepathic network, that may be more visual than, than word-based, um, but where individuality is retained. We see this, for example, in the, the Benny Jesuit Reverend Mothers of the Dune books, for those who are familiar with that mythology. Um, this is an image I bought at a festival a couple of years ago. I met the artist, and here we see... Um, the, the boundaries of these individuals are breaking down. They're becoming networked together, and at the center is a spiral galaxy. So you see, you see this motif many, many places. Um, one of the most striking and the most related um, to near-death experience, in fact, I, I end the book with this subject. I'm not ending my talk with it, but I, I might as well cut to it now because it's the ultimate example of the connection to near-death experience is the movie and the novel 2001. Again, Arthur C. Clarke, and this, the, 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 these were created simultaneously. The, the movie didn't come out of the book. They both worked on them together. This is a collaboration of two ultimate geniuses, Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. It's as if Beethoven and Bach got together, together to create a, a, an opera together. Um, and, uh, and I regard um, the movie 2001, which opened to poor reviews um, back in, you know, in the, uh, 1968 or whatever, um, as you know, a work of art comparable to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Um, but it just shows you how much you know, um, some clueless rationalists can totally um, miss something like that. Um, I won't try and... Um, I'll just give you, how many people have seen 2001? Okay, good. All right. So I won't try and, and um, repeat the whole plot of the movie, but we're basically getting a tale about um, a quantum evolutionary jumps, right? Um, and the first one we see is when this black monolith appears uh, to a, a group of missing link hominoids, right? And they're, they're you know, just... Uh, eating weeds and stuff like that, and they're like out in the, uh, you know, a desert or something. And now this monolith appears and it, it rewires their brains and advances them. And now um, <clears throat> suddenly they become conscious of tools and they pick up bones that have been lying around. They realize that they can kill these pig-like animals um, that are there. And now they are attacked by a similar hominid tribe that has not been advanced and now, because they can wield these clubs, um, the alpha of their, the enhanced tribe comes forward and defeats the alpha, bludgeons the alpha of the other tribe. And then, um, <clears throat> uh, in a triumphant gesture, he tosses this bone club up in the air. We watch it spiraling in the air. And then, in a 24th of a second, because that's one frame in, in film, 50,000 years are, are spliced out. And the next thing we see is a similarly shaped white spacecraft in the night sky. Now, <clears throat> that spacecraft, this is an important detail if you have to read the history of 2001, was intended to be a nuclear doomsday machine. The reason why this was left out of the novel and the movie is that what was Stanley Kubrick's most famous film right before 2001? Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove. It would just seem like too much to have another nuclear doomsday motif after he just did Dr. Strangelove, you know, the ultimate movie about nuclear doomsday. But it was a very important point because the idea is that in that 50,000 years, there's this incredible evolution, and yet we're still territorial killer apes. We just went from, a, you know, a bone club to a, a nuclear uh, satellite. <clears throat> Um, but now um, we are coming up to the next evolutionary event horizon, and there are two streams of evolution at work. Because um, when 
um, you know, and basically, uh, you know, they, they excavate on the moon. They get a, a powerful anomalous radio signal, um, it, you know, uh, happens on the moon. And um, it, it occurs when they've, they've excavated because they found a magnetic anomaly on the moon and they excavated and find a black monolith. And as soon as that black monolith, um, the first sunrise happens, it turns out it, it's, it's solar powered. It emits this powerful radio signal and the radio signal um, is sent out to Iapetus, a moon of um, Jupiter. Uh, actually, um, they wanted the planet to be Saturn, but the special effects of the time didn't, didn't think they could pull up the rings of Saturn, but Saturn would have been more appropriate in some ways. But it goes out to Iapetus. And now um, a spaceship called the Discovery One is sent out and and it looks like this. It looks like a sperm cell. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's got a, got a head and a long thin body and a tail. There's a discovery one. You can look it up online. And, um, and now we have a zero-sum battle between two competing forms of evolution. One is the HAL 9000 AI computer. And then we have the pinnacle of for an atheist astrophysicist of human evolution, astronauts, you know. Um, but the, the, the one astronaut that survives um, the HAL 9000's um, murderous rampage, which is explained in a much more complex way in the book. It was really a psychological problem, you know. Um, but that's a whole other story that the HAL 9000 had. But um, <clears throat> his name is Bowman which is interesting because it sort of like brings you back to that primitive ape with a weapon thing, the Bowman. Um, but um, <clears throat> when Bowman um, goes to land, um, go, go, gets closer to Diapetus, he sees what looks like an eye at the center of it. And what it is, is a, a, a giant black monolith. And now when he lands on this monolith, this is where the term Stargate um, comes from. It's an, it's an interdimensional porter, and, and he goes through this like M.C. Escher-like state of total disorientation because he's going to pass through it like this interdimensional birth canal. And now this is where we have this tremendous intersection with near-death experience. Now, let's remember the timeline. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, 1975. That's where the term life review was coined and near-death experience, Right. This is 1968. Um, okay. And um, he finds that he is hurtling through what is both an interdimensional corridor and an evolutionary event horizon. It is both the threshold of death and a birth canal. The ca canal the astronaut Bowman passes through is also the tunnel so often described in the NDE, where the experiencer will often say they feel like they are traveling at the speed of light. For example, a near-death experiencer reports, the blackness began to erupt into a myriad of stars, and I felt as if I were at the center of the universe with a complete panoramic view in all directions. The next instant, um, I began um, to, to feel a forward surge of movement. The stars seemed to fly past me so rapidly that they formed a tunnel around me. Now, we know that not every near-death experience has the, the tunnel effect, but, it, but it, a, a substantial group um, experience it. Now here's a description from 2001. The star field was expanding as if it was rushing toward him at an inconceivable speed. The expansion was nonlinear. The stars at the center hardly seemed to move, while those toward the edge accelerated more and more swiftly until they became streaks of light just before they vanished from view. 2001 was written um, several years before Life After Life. And uh, the Life Review um, now is so well known, but it was unheard of, basically, um, uh, in, a, 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 unless you were like a mystic or something, or a real, real esoteric. There's a chapter here um, <clears throat> on your death experience, and um, it begins with a quote from Herman Melville's Moby Dick that is really about encountering the singularity archetype um, at the threshold of death. So this is Herman Melville in the 19th century. And death, which alike levels all, 
alike impresses all with the last revelation, which only an author from the dead could adequately tell. Now we have so many more authors from the dead, you know, for one thing, because of not only because of cultural awareness of the NDE, but the explosion and resuscitation capability, as I'm sure you all know. Okay, so now, <clears throat> okay, um, so here's one man's description from the NDE literature of his life review. It's like a picture runs in front of your eyes, like from the time you can remember up to the time you know what was happening. That is the present moment. It seems like pictures of your life just flow in front of your eyes. The things you need to do um, when you were small and stuff, stupid things. It was like a picture. It was like a movie camera running across your eyes in a matter of a second or two, just boom, boom, boom. I'll go to another one. It was, uh, this is from a woman. I was amazing. I could see the back of my head as an array, just an innumerable array of thoughts, memories, things I had dreamt, just in general, thoughts and recollections of the past just raced in front of me. Um, my brothers, sisters, grandmothers, dreams I had, I felt like um, the frame, millions of frames just flashed through. Um, it was thoughts and images of people. And a lot of thoughts just raced. I mean, but you guys already know about this. So this is very familiar. Okay, now here's the description of what happens to Bowman from 1968, uh, the novel, um, when he crosses the event horizon, before the term, seven years before the term life review was coined. The springs of memory were being trapped. In controlled recollections, he was reliving the past. And not only vision, but all the sense impressions and all the emotions he had felt at the time were racing past more and more swiftly. And remember, these are two atheists. Arthur C. Clarke and Kubrick. His life was unreeling like a tape recorder playing back at ever increasing speed. And even as he relived, relived these events, he knew that all was indeed well. He was retrogressing down the corridors of time, being drained of knowledge and experience as he swept back toward his childhood. But nothing was being lost. All that he had ever been at every moment of his life was being transferred to safer keeping. Even as one David Bowman ceased to exist, another became immortal. Okay? Now, if you remember the end of the film, we have a series of autoscopic experiences, a series of out-of-body experiences where he is seeing himself from an outside point of view. So first, he is the astronaut at his present age, at the start of the voyage, more or less, you know, and he steps into this sort of like alien generated, you know, um, hotel room with, with lighted floors and, and antique French looking furniture. And he hears uh, the noise of the sounds of like somebody eating at a table. And now he sees himself as an older man, like a late middle aged man, dining at the table. And then he becomes that point of view. He becomes himself at that older age, like a like a NDE flash forward almost. And now he is we he and us, the viewer, are seeing through the eyes of this older man, and the older man is hearing another noise from another room. And now this man of 65 or so and so forth is walking into a room where there is a man who looks like he's 120 years old or something who looks almost like a fetus, he's so profoundly aged, and who is lying on a bed. And now our point of view switches again um, to just the, the man on his deathbed. And now what we see in the hotel room at the foot of the bed is another black monolith. And look, look at how it is like a tombstone. It is a, 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 a portal there at the edge of the deathbed. But I might need to, I'll send around another book because I might need that one to, uh, um, let's see if we can find that image again. <clears throat> okay. Send this one around. Okay. And so what happens after he goes through this death, um, you know, the monolith appears as both tombstone and evolutionary portal. And as a dying man, he reaches toward the monolith in the identical manner of Adam reaching toward God in Michelangelo's ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. You know, the image called God creating Adam. And out of the birth canal, 
he is then goes from being this man on his deathbed, he becomes the star child. He becomes, a, a, he is reborn as a being that has tremendous psychic powers and that, that appears as, a, as like an, um, a fetus inside a luminous sphere of awareness that can travel in any direction um, at all. Uh, this is like the kind of um, glorified body that somebody um, may erupt into in an OBE or an NDE um, uh, that still has some kind of physical form but uh, can like, sort of translocate at will and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Uh, here's a, a Bowman's experience um, of emerging into a glorified body. He still needed for a little while the shell of matter as the focus of his powers. His indestructible body was his mind's present image of itself, right out of the discussion of uh, the psychosoma in the OBE class that, that Gabriel teaches. And for all his powers, he knew that it was still a baby, so he would remain until he had decided on a new form or had passed beyond the necessities of matter which would be the mental soma, right? And, and um, this is discussed in the book too, that the, the more advanced beings have, have left matter far behind and are now just lattices of light or whatever. Um, and, and then there's a, a wonderful description of his um, <clears throat> uh, crossing the event horizon. Um, the stars were thinning out. The glare of the Milky Way was dimming into a pale ghost of the glory he had known, and when he was ready, would know again. He was back, precisely where he wished to be, in the space that men called real. Now, this is what people have near-death experiences describe, is that they're, they're coming home. They're in a place that's more real than this plane. So, that is my final example. <clears throat> But there's a whole lot more to be said about the singularity archetype. How are we doing on time? Should I? Because I can, I can switch to Q&A, but there's a whole lot more um, to be said about that. I don't even know what time it is. Sorry. Um, it no. is 8.20. But, um, okay. Okay, well, in that case, I will, I will push through the illusion and uh, keep talking. Um, okay. So one of the aspects of the... Um, collective evolution that this, that the singularity archetype relates to um, is that it is currently underway in all kinds of ways that were, were not as readily visible in the case when I first wrote about this in 1978. Um, because right now uh, what's happening is a huge transformation of consciousness because of the explosion of visual technologies. And there's a, a real seminal book um, by uh, Leonard Schlein called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. But if we think back um, <clears throat> you know, to the last great, let, let, let's, before we even get to this uh, evolutionary change, let, let's go back in time a little bit um, <clears throat> to a, uh, as far back as I can think of where there was an evolutionary explosion, and that was the, called the pre cam Precambrian um, explosion. 544 million years ago, there are only three phyla of life. And then by 538 million years ago, seven million years later, which was short in that standard of life development, um, there had been such an explosion of evolution that there were then 38 phyla of life, the same number that exists presently. And this is called the Precambrian Explosion. And um, uh, there's a British scientist, uh, Andrew Parker, um, who wrote about this. Um, it's called the light switch theory. His belief is that what caused this evolutionary explosion was eyes. Organisms were now sophisticated enough to have eyes. And as soon as you can have eyes, now you have predators and prey. And so you, you need to have a, a, a much more complex variety of life become possible once eyes come into being. And eyes continue to be hugely significant um, to the present um, evolutionary shift. So um, <clears throat> there was a, a shift in planetary consciousness um, that happened roughly about 6,000 years ago. Um, and that uh, social historian Rianne Eisler wrote about in her seminal book, 
the chalice and the blade. Ashley Montague said it might be the most important book ever written. Basically, what she was writing about is that up until the late Paleolithic, around the earth there were these uh, what she called partnership societies that were much less violent, where relations between the genders were roughly egalitarian. The iconic object was the chalice, a symbol of fecundity and fertility and so forth. And then um, this huge shift started to happen all over the planet of a shift to dominator societies. And this continues to the present age, the patriarchal age, um, where, uh, um, the, where culture became masculinized. In fact, um, Joseph Campbell was another observer of this change, and also my late colleague Terence McKenna wrote about it. He had his own theory that had to do with mushrooms. Some have just derisively called it the stone to ape theory, but that's another story. has a lot of holes in it. But um, uh, Joseph Campbell, in a five-volume study of mythology called The Mass of God, describes the same shift that Rianne Eisler observed. And um, it's schematized by Campbell in four steps as follows. The world born of a goddess without cons- consort. This is what we find, you know, in, uh, up to like ancient Crete and that, around that time. Then we have the world born of a goddess, but um, she's impregnated by a male consort. Then we have the world fosh- fashioned from the body of a goddess by a, um, a male warrior god. And then we have um, the world created by the unaided power of a male god alone. So um, <clears throat> what triggered this huge shift? Well, uh, Leonard Schlein makes a pretty strong case that it was the introduction of the technology of written alphabets. Once you have alphabetical, alphanumerical um, literacy introduced, now um, there is a profound shift to the left hemisphere. That's the one that processes alphabet and number. And and now you have um, what starts to happen is a text becomes the ruling dominant object. Hammurabi's Code, the Bible, the Koran, the Rule of Law, the DSM-4. We're still living in that age where we are ruled over by documents, the Constitution, whatever it is, for better or worse. And once um, you know, uh, writing becomes um, the ultimate form of power. Now, women can usually no longer participate in religious witch rituals in most cultures. That's only done by the male priesthood. Um, and um, clerics will tend to wear black and white, the colors of ink and paper. And um, it will also become a commandment to not have images. Um, all three of the Abrahamic faiths um, have an intense anti-image bias. Um, most strong when they, most strong when that culture first goes through um, its literary stage. So, for example, the second of the Ten Commandments. A lot of people think that must be "Thou shalt not kill." Now, that's like six or seven. Okay, the first commandment is just like. I am the one God, there are no others, you know, I'm establishing my power. The second commandment is about not having images. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the water or or that is in the water under the earth. Now notice this popularly interpreted as about, oh, that was just about not having idol worship. Um, No, it says right in the the Torah, um, um, and this is well. This is from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. So it's about not having images of any kind. Now the whole idol thing, and idol actually comes from. Um, a Latin word that comes from a Greek word, idolum, that means image. Okay, um, and what was Yahweh's first instruction to Adam in Genesis was to attach word labels to things. Okay, um, and so um, then we would have um, the anti image um, Christianity comes next in the lineage of the Abrahamic faiths. And so whichever one is the more recent will have the later extreme anti-image phase later. So the, the, um, 
in the 8th century, and this is around the time of the birth of Islam as well, um, a Christian sect arises called the iconoclasts. And iconoclasts literally means image destroyers. And these were people that the, um, Pope Leo III ordered all church murals covered with plaster and all likenesses of the virgin, the one female part of the religion brought in, effaced. Their targets also included painters, sculptors, and craftsmen. Monks who resisted were blinded. And of course, they bust up you know, irreplaceable statues from classical antiquity. Well, what is the most anti-image and the most contemporarily anti-image of the Abrahamic phase, of course, is Islam. Um, what does it do to women? It puts burqa, a black tarp over them, um, castrating their ability for the visual communication that human beings are capable of more than any other animal. We have a face unlike any other animal. We have 150 muscles in our face. We communicate through these microfacial expressions. They erase that. And you can't have any representation of the prophet. If somebody in Denmark makes a cartoon of the prophet, people 2,000, you know, the 25 people on another 2,000 miles away are slaughtered um, because of that. So you have this anti-feminine, anti-image bias in these text-based religions. Well, um, right now, um, we have the lowest rates of violence um, in human history and in, probably in pre-recorded history as well. Um, there's a guy, Steven Pinker, gave a TED talk. He's a psychologist who's written about this, that you know, um, right now we have the lowest per capita war death rate. It's horrible what's going on in Syria, but if you, you know, it's, it's horrible to apply statistics to this, but if you do, um, you've got to average the 100,000 people you know, we've lost in, in Syria in the last couple of years to a population of 7 billion, and we right now have the lowest per capita war death rate of all time. In fact, and of and prehistory, because as he points out, your odds as a young man of being killed in warfare in an aboriginal rainforest tribe are fi- far higher than they ever were in the West, even during the bloody 20th century. So um, and this drop in violence, it, which is not talked about enough because you have people like Donald Trump, you know, claiming that, you know, that we're, we're, the country is in a, you know, a disaster or whatever. Uh, well, it's not. I mean, people keep pointing out that, you know, the crime, crime rates are not up. I mean, they're, they're much lower than the 70s. When I was growing up in New York City, um, it was incredibly violent. There were 2,000 murders a year. Now there's like a 350 in New York City, which is a higher population. But even subjectively, when I would go and visit my parents and ride the number four train, in the 80s, I taught in the South Bronx. And now the kind of ghetto kids that I used to see in the 80s and dealt with every day and that were, were rough customers, quite a lot of them, now they just seem chilled out and androgynous and like, you know, it's just like, whoa, you know, what has happened here? People seem much nicer. They're much more polite and notoriously rude in New York. Now, maybe that is the organochlorines lowering the testosterone, but I think it may be the, the, um, <clears throat> the, the visual technologies. As the famous Canadian you know, media guru, Marshall McLuhan, said, the medium is the message. And especially, you know, this may be true neurologically. So even if uh, it's first-person shooter video games, the, the content may not matter. By, by being in this visually rich environment, the brain is being massively rewired. The thing that may have triggered the dominator edge, the right brain dominance, may be shifting right now. And um, it, it's having really profound effects. And we, we, we have grown up, all of us, in the midst of this explosion of visual technologies. I pointed out to people, you know, that, you know, because I mean, all of us have grown up in the age of television and movies. Um, but, you know, when my father was born in New York City, not such a backwater, there were no commercial radio stations in New York City. When my grandfather was born, one of them, um, in Latvia in 1883, and he grew up in a town where there was no, no electricity, you know, and now I'm the third generation, look, look where I am with, you know, virtual reality, you know, starting. And virtual reality, I think, is going to be the, the trigger event that's going to drastically shift things. It's, and the consumer part of it is just getting going. But, you know, Gabriel and I have talked about this. I think it may, um, you know, in the next two or three years, we're going to find um, using off-the-shelf hardware that we may be able to create OBEs on demand in people by changing their sense of their orientation to their physical body. Um <clears throat> And so, you know, if you think about this, um, silent movies 
when they showed the first silent movies, everything was of a train pulling into the station. People were diving for their seats. You know, they, 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 they even though they had magic lantern slides, you know, in the 19th Victorian times, they, they just couldn't comprehend this moving image. When they had the first zoom lens, because they just had fixed focal length lenses up until then, and they showed the first shot of zooming in on a woman's face, people were gasping. They thought this woman's face was blowing up like a balloon. They couldn't comprehend it. Meanwhile, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I watched an Avengers movie with a nine-year-old and a, you know, uh, 11-year-old, and the opening credits, there's this surreal montage with, you know, editing cuts fast enough to give you an epileptic seizure and so forth, and it's completely surreal, and they're completely comprehending everything, you know, without any effort whatsoever. So this is what we're, we're growing up in, this increasingly surreal and complex visual environment and um, basically we are um, you know uh, creating a uh, the boundary between the world physical world and the psychic world is melting away um, so you know if you think about the iconic object of the you know in early industrial revolution the locomotive I mean it had one purpose but now what is the iconic object of our era it's the pixelated screen and this is like a magic um, psychic mirror, except that it's not recording my talk, which is disappointing, but um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> maybe this one is working. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, that's why I do Tim. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, it, it is a um, like a magic mirror. First of all, it is like the realm of the afterlife or the near-death experience or that one finds in the OBE. It's idioplastic. It's, thought re it's a thought-responsive matrix. Whatever I'm obsessed with, for good or bad, maybe I'm obsessed with, you know, Japanese schoolgirls and S&M poses. I just typed that into Google and there it is. Whatever it is, you know, um, I, I, it, it, whatever's in my psyche or unconscious, there it will appear on the screen. So we are breaking down that barrier and um, this is going to shift things so that, that what, you know, people are having in a near-death experience some echo of this may be available um, through virtual reality that will be able to, to uh, track what you're obsessed with and, and um, so forth. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, let's talk about the near-death experience as a, an encounter with the singularity archetype. Um, one thing about, um, first of all, it's, a, it's an end of time, rupture of plane experience as we talked about um, that, that transforms core values and those of you who know about Dr. Pim Van Lummel's research, the first uh, prospective studies of near-death experience, and his findings were published in the prestigious medical journal Lancet. And, um, you know, as Dr. Kenneth Ring points out, it was discovered that 10 years out, the power of the experience has only grown. Now, this suggests an archetype, which is a continuous energy source, because no matter what the trauma or event you would expect its effect, effects to diminish through time, but not if it's an archetype. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, the near-death experience um, produces all the effects that the futuristic versions of the singularity archetype suggest, the homo gestalt, where now you're in a telepathic network. The boundary between self and other disappears. In your life review, you may see the same scene, but from the perspective of other people who are there, so that you're not bound to your egocentric uh, perspective anymore. Um, <clears throat> people after their near-death experience, you know, the control group was people had cardiac arrest and no NDE. Those people became more formally religious, going to church more often, but their reported spirituality went down. For the people who had uh, cardiac arrest and N NDEs, they stopped going to church for the most part, but their reported spirituality went up. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, Dr. Ring, um, very explicitly um, in the Omega Project and Heading Toward Omega, talks about the near-death experience as related to an evolutionary metamorphosis. Uh, this is Dr. Ring, um, who said that experiences agree that um, their experiences reflect a purposive intelligence and they are part of an accelerating evolutionary current that is propelling the human race toward a higher consciousness and heightened spirituality. A lot of their visions... Um, which will be about the importance of taking care of the environment and so forth, things that people who have in NDEs parallel those that people who have abduction experiences will report. Um, and 
all these um, things like paranormal vision and so forth, um, these, be, these actually happen to people who have NDEs. There's a chart somewhere in the book that shows, you know, um, uh, paranormal um, phenomena like clairvoyance, telepathy, precognition, deja vu, enhanced intuition, um, OBE, perception of auras, psychic phenomenon, and it shows like the general population and then before NDE, after NDE, um, all of them way up in the group that has NDE. Another consistently reported finding is a type of electromagnetic effect that people have had NDEs may adversely affect computers and other devices subject to quantum um, fluctuations. Um, <clears throat> the whole thing about the um, uh, paranormal vision that turns up in a lot of the futuristic extrapolations from Superman's X-ray vision on, um, you know, we have um, Dr. Kenneth Ring and Sharon Cooper's book, Mindsight, where people who are congenitally blind since birth will have visually comprehended near-death experiences. That's pretty hard to explain um, if you're a neurological materialist. Um, people talk about the telepathic aspects. There was a, a child um, of five years old or something telling about his NDE and he said he met this man made of light and he said he talked to me and he points to his head le like this, not like this. Um, so this is a very universal um, or nearly universal part of the phenomenon. Um, and um, in Heading Toward Omega in the Major Project, Dr. Ring overlaps NDE in the singularity archetype by wondering if near-death experiences might be, quote, the prototype of a new, more advanced strain of the human species striving to come into manifestation. No longer homo sapiens, perhaps. Could NDEers be, then, an evolutionary bridge to the next step in our destiny as a species, a missing link in our midst? And it's amazing that, like, you know, since the field was broken open in 1975. There's been this explosion of resuscitation technology to where we have a much higher percentage of the population surviving um, um, a, a death experience. Um, according to Dr. Ring, NDEs are a kind of exp experiential catalyst for human evolution that potentially, at least, these experiences that we know have occurred to many millions of persons across the globe are serving the purpose of jump-stepping the human race to a higher level of spiritual awareness and psycho, uh, psychophysical functioning. And this is something he wrote in the 80s. And from my perspective, NDEs are individual encounters with the singularity archetype. Um, and I think increasing awareness of them and the pioneering work on out-of-body experience, and virtual reality, um, are key um, catalysts um, that may bring on this evolutionary event horizon. Um, that doesn't mean I associate it with a particular date, and it also doesn't mean that um, the outcome is guaranteed because extinction may, may still hang there in the balance. Um, it may be that only when we have, uh, only by having a sort of Damocles hanging over our head where the whole genome is threatened, do you have enough power to potentiate a quantum evolutionary change? Because what um, biologists notice is that organisms are conservative, homeostasis. They dial in at an equilibrium and they try and maintain its stability. They're not going to radically mutate um, without cause. Um, and both Freud and Jung notice that the human psyche is similarly quite conservative. Better the devil I know than the one I don't know, and that's why most people as they age who have not had near-death experiences or some other transformative experience, their neurotic symptoms just become sharper and more rigid and so forth. Um, they just become more and more themselves. An example of where you see near-death experience and the singularity archetype converge in a more recent blockbuster movie, we're waiting for the sequel, Avatar. Okay, the opening scene of Avatar, what do we see? We see an out-of-body experience. Jake, who is a paraplegic marine, um, is a disembodied point of view flying over a rainforest. Now, this is very interesting, his body type. Okay, he is in the most um, unhappy mortal scenario we, we can think of, and one that would potentiate the desire for an OBE or to escape the meat body because he is this healthy, vital, young male warrior marine, except now he's a paraplegic. So he really wants to get out of his body into something else. And how does he do it? I mean, the, to me, the most numinous moment is when he is rolling up in his wheelchair 
Um, and he sees the avatar lying there, and it's like glass sarcophagus, basically. And, you know, he's seeing like, this could be my future super body. Um, but I'm going to connect to. He's also a twin, an identical twin, and that's why he's called into this. And identical twins have a connection to evolution, because the last great evolutionary jump was when we learned to like think in words. This is what separated us from the other animals. It could be that that happened with twins, because twins, identical twins, will develop something called twin speak. They'll develop their own language. Um, so they would be the ideal catalyst to first, um, <clears throat> um, you know. Um, trigger this development of language, which would have had to have existed as a latent capacity, um, um, but that wouldn't emerge until perhaps a whole hominid group was threatened with extinction and there was evolutionary pressure for this latent capacity to emerge. Similarly, because William James famously said, all that's necessary to disprove the notion that all crows are black is one white crow. We have so many white crow experiences of people having paranormal abilities. Taking all those white crow experiences together, you just define the outer edges of the current human performance envelope. These emerge episodically now, but under significant enough evolutionary pressure, they might emerge in some much more powerful and collective way and then have still further unexpected um, emergent properties when they, when they start to manifest. Um, so um, what does Jake do to merge with this blue glowing avatar? Um, he gets into what looks like a technological sarcophagus or, or coffin. He, he, his old body dies. He goes through a tunnel of light that he streaks through like in 2001. And now he's in his new um, Pandora, Navi avatar body. So um, uh, avatar is highly collected, connected to the singularity archetype. I've got a whole chapter on it. And... Um, near-death experience. I'm going to try and wrap this up. Um, um, the, there is a, a, well, let me actually, one more example that relates, so just briefly, I don't know, have you seen the movie Powder? It's a Disney movie about a mutant, okay, who has all these paranormal abilities. Well, first of all, he looks like a corpse. Um, he is connected to death. He was created when his mother was struck by lightning and while pregnant with him, and she dies, but he's born out of that death, and he's an albino, and he lives in the basement of his parents' house. So he looks sort of like a, a, a corpse, even though he's sort of a vital young man. And um, he is um, very, uh, disturbs anything electrical. Um, and this is, happens in the um, his science class where the uh, teacher has that 19th century elect electrical device that you s used to see in Frankenstein movies with the, the arc, you know, of, of sparks traveling between these two metal poles, and that is called a Jacob's ladder. Well, uh, Jacob's ladder um, in the Bible um, was the gateway into the afterlife, uh, the stairway into the afterlife. Um, and uh, there, it, one, one powerful scene, there, there's so many relevances here, but I, I don't have time to get into all of them, is he actually creates an NDE in somebody else. There's a brutal policeman who is also kind of teamed up with a schoolyard bully that's attacking Powder because he's like a, a transformative mutant and they're disturbed by his androgyny and so forth. And there are even hints that he may be gay. And this is upsetting them. And the policeman has gone out with these very thuggish, you know, Neanderthal, or, okay, I would, Neanderthals are probably cool, but, you know, more primitive, aggressive, you know, um, uh, high school boys, and they're, they're, triumphantly he shoots a deer, and Powder, who's like a vegan, is horrified, and so forth. So um, when the policeman is standing over the dead deer, he, he, Powder touches the deer as it's dying and grabs hold of the policeman's wrist, and now the policeman his ego boundaries are ruptured and he's experiencing what the deer is experiencing as it's dying. This is like a near death experience and that he's breaking out of his egocentric perspective to have like almost like a life review and seeing what he's done. And now, you know, the policeman is totally transformed like somebody who's had an NDE and stops hunting and stops eating meat and, and so forth. So that's another very recent um, example um, that one was from the 1990s. Anyway, um, I'll just mention that um, uh, that the uh, 
singularity archetype can pathologize, as I pointed out, into apocalypticism. An example of the singularity archetype pathologizing is the Heaven's Gate suicide cult. So this is the logo, it's still up their website, Heaven's Gate. Well, this is like the Stargate of 2001. And they were filled with, um, you know, Heaven's Gate is just sort of a pseudo-biblical way of saying the event horizon. And um, uh, many of you may remember um, uh, these two, uh, Marshall Applegate, um, on March 24th of 1997, 39 members of the group dressed in identical black uniforms with brand new black and white Nike Windrum runner shoes and triangular arm patches labeled Heaven's Gate Away Team, they were partly inspired by Star Trek, committed suicide with a lethal combination of phenobarbital, vodka, and plastic bags tied around their heads. Um, they felt that there was a, um, a spaceship, you know, on the dark side of the moon waiting for them, that they were going to um, uh, leave their physical bodies um, that they were already unhappy with. Many of the males had already had themselves surgically castrated. And um, basically, everything that these two, who were like a former nurse and school teacher, who suddenly in late mental age became you know, these, these, they were these total like people you would never notice suddenly became magnetically charismatic because they were possessed by an archetype. Archetypes can inspire, but they can also possess. And when you're possessed with an archetype, you become extremely inflated. You think you have a unique messianic mission and so forth. And you can become very charismatic because you're connected to these, these powerful energies. So, um, you've endured an incredibly long and complex talk. Um, if anybody still has energy, I, I'd be happy to answer questions or hear comments or anything. Did it record? I think this one is recording, so we're going we're gonna to hope that this one is working. Yes, sir. Should have done the quote from uh, David Bowerman in 2010, where he was appearing to the crew of the uh, U.S. Russian spaceship, where he was coming in and saying something wonderful is about to happen. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, that was a very interesting sequel with Roy uh, Scheider, and um, I, I remember that part because he does seem sort of like uh, you know as if he's had a near-death experience. He almost sounded like. Uh, the way uh, Steve Jobs was reported, his last words were, oh, wow, oh, wow. So um, <clears throat> it, it, it did seem uh, something like that. It's almost like he has merged with the uh, alien intelligence at that point. Right. By the way, you're not the author of the book Suicide in the <laughs> Afterlife, are you? Because you, you look a little bit like that gentleman. I can't think of his name right now. But that's probably not you. I think he's in a different part of the country. Okay, that's an amazing book, by the way. Um, anybody else? Is anybody cold? I always I forgot to ask how people felt. Was it heat up? I think it might be on the warm side, but maybe okay. I might be standing. Yeah. That's why I asked. Warm. <laughs> that's why I asked. Gabriel. Um, I'm just curious what you thought about the following. If you see instances of the singularity archetype like appearing in our current discourse, like culturally here in the United States, like for example, I've noticed like for example with the election of Donald Trump, things like this, there's uh, there's sort of like this kind of negative, like for example, I just saw an article that was saying about like the downfall of Western society because of all these events that could possibly take place, you know. Like, I don't know, we get into a war with North Korea, this kind of, you know, things like this. Do you see these as being examples of the singularity archetype or any kind of like instances of it in any way, shape, or form? Some of this current discourse that's. Um, well, I do. In fact, um, I was invited um, here um, because somebody read my article, I forget who, um, in Reality Sandwich about, uh, you know, um, Take the red pill, you know, you know, why Trumpocalypse reveals we may be living in a simulated matrix. It was written a little bit, you know, as a humorous provocation. I wrote a more serious follow up called the, you know, uh, red pill exegesis or something. But what I point out is that um, what we're seeing, what we saw with the election of Trump, among many other things, is a sort of crossing over of the dream time 
and a, uh, a surrealizing of the historical process with the synchronicities um, being so extreme and where improbable events where the statistical reality was giving way to something more like a dream and where, you know, many people are still pinching themselves, you know, when they, when they hear the phrase President Trump. Um, you know, cons consider um, this, I mean, you know, and, and this has happened before, like the year and one year anniversary of 9-11 in New York City, where they had the uh, lotto and they had one of those hot air ping pong ball machines that to, to generate a random number. And the first three numbers it came up with were 911. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but Donald Trump, first of all, if you look up Trump in the dictionary, Trump is a, is a trick winning card. And it almost seemed like um, it was so unexpected. You know, he didn't think he was going to win. Nobody thought he was going to win. And somehow the animal spirits, the irrational forces of the collective unconscious created this extremely improbable event. And there are just uh, incredible, um, improbable synchronicities associated with it. Like, for example, I think it was NBC. There was a television show on broadcast television in 1954. It was some kind of a Western show. And there is a man who's a charlatan who's coming to town whose name is Walter Trump. And he's telling people that the world is about to end and only he can save them if they pay him to build a wall around the town. Oh, um, and there's a whole set of these incredible weird synchronicities. Um, I don't have the article in front of me to jog my memory uh, related to Donald Trump. I mean, and, and it's also like the, these name synchronicities that show up, you know, with like that his name is Trump. Also, like something that I've noticed is because Jung had a name synchronicity theory because his name Jung means young. His psychology is based on the rebirth principle. Freud in German means joy. His base was on his was based on the pleasure principle. There are some synchronicities with my last name, Zap. <clears throat> um, if you consider the name, the, 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 the names of some of the key Republican figures, now I don't want to be too partisan, but I'll just reveal my bias anyway. <laughs> their, their names, like, you know, you know if you thought that, that, that a Disney name of a villain like De, um, Cruella de Vil, you know, <clears throat> Cruel yeah. Devil or whatever, you know, was over the top, you know, or, or you know, you think of like some of, um, uh, you know, Charles Dickens' names for, you know, bad characters, the Murdstones, Uriah Heep. He would pick these names. It's just like Uriah Heep. It sounds like a disease, right? So we have um, Ryan's Priebus. Like, who names their kid Ryan's Priebus unless you're, like, from an extraterrestrial bat species? <laughs> Ryan's Priebus, Rush Limbaugh, uh, Trent Lott, Dick Army. Like, you know, you, there are all these... Um, high-profile Republicans with these really bizarre names that are picked, you know, and, and, and Trump talked about, you know, um, picking people to be in his cabinet, you know, that looked like they were sent from central casting. This is how he was picking them out. And so we have, like, you know, some of them, fortunately, on the security side seem to be highly competent. But, you know, a lot of them, like, you know, that secretary of education and so forth. I mean, they, they're, um, you know, like, like sort of low-rent Batman villains that are like anti the very thing that they're supposed to be representing. So we have this surrealization of the historic process. And, and that seems like another case, like the pixelated screen, where um, the firewall between the psyche and outside reality is breaking down. As you were talking about the uh, pixelated screen example, um, it, it's interesting because it seems like there's these kind of two competing possible trains that maybe is kind of getting to what you're talking about, the pathologized version and the like enlightened version, right? So you kind of leaned on the lighter side of things, but then when I look at like the transhumanist movement, um, you know, people like Elon Musk, for example, think that our solution to keep lock and step with AI is to have like nanobots in our brain and cloud cloud uh, um, cloud mm. networking of our thoughts, right. which kind of gets to this painting into your example there. Uh, one, one kind of intuition I had about this, though, is that, you know, when you think of technology in that terms, it is like very much like giving yourself a bigger brain. But the caveat is like a bigger, weaker brain. Right. You know, we, we don't necessarily develop 
the true capacities by just co interconnecting everything on a whim because it's it seems to kind of fall the least common denominator, right? So if I can, you, your examples are right on. It's like if I can have this kind of impulse device, uh, given my current state of maturity, where am I where am I driving myself to? Where's my thoughts going to? Is it's, it's like to the you know sense gratification. Uh, sexualization or food or you know something that's very very base even though you're using this completely psychic device to, to reach those things I think it's really kind of an irony of where we are it's like we have this you know so to me I think the interconnection is is wonderful but the interconnection without the maturity is is problematic I, I couldn't agree more and this is why I think that people who've had NDEs are unlikely to be this type of naive transhumanist right. like an Elon Musk or a Ray Kurzweil. And so these people talk about the singularity, but these people um, are brilliant but incredibly naive materialists, in my opinion. Um, they are neurological materialists. Um, that's the reigning creed in colleges and universities where, where consciousness, if it's, if it's acknowledged to exist at all, and, and you know, many of them led by the philosopher William Dennett with his identity theory, um, as you know, Gabriel, um, <clears throat> you know, don't be believe that consciousness doesn't exist at all. If it's admitted to exist at all, it's an epiphenomenon or secondary effect of biochemical process in the brain. So because these people believe that we're just sort of like the, these faulty, wet computers in our heads, they, they, they assume that um, they can just transfer themselves to more reliable hardware. And um, they, so they have these ideas that they must, through their own technological efforts, um, create an afterlife um, that is already organically available without having to resort to such means. And um, so they have the, the, the uh, you know, a dreadful technological version of um, what is already the case. And so, you know, they, they imagine a kind of you know, uh, quantum computer rapture where they'll, you know, be able to transfer their uh, consciousness as if it were a binary code into, you know, some kind of faster computer. And, um, and there was a documentary about Ray's, Ray Kurzweil called Transcendent Man. And if you watch the documentary, he certainly doesn't seem like a transcendent man at all. He seems like a desperately neurotic anxious man who you watch nervously taking his 65 supplements a day because he's <laughs> desperately trying to hold on to his meat body long enough until he can like you know transfer it to a quantum computer and also these people um, keep, always keep telling us that AI is just around the corner well I'm old enough to remember um, Marvin Minsky of MIT giving talks in the 60s and he said it was 10 years out then and if you remember the HAL 9000 of um, the movie 2001 was supposed to have gone online in 1995. Well, we missed that deadline. And so now it's still just around the corner. But um, because these people are so such naive materialists, I think that they can end up in the position of the sorcerer's apprentice, where they may end up creating another life form, but it may not happen at all in the way that they imagine. They think it's something that will emerge from their software and their hardware. But what if you create a complex enough physical substrate because there, there's a woman who studies studied um, human energy fields named Madeline Hunt out of uh, University of California I believe you know um, <clears throat> she claimed based on the sensitives that she talked to that that it seemed like they felt like the soul was in a body only after the first trimester like maybe it needed enough tissue complexity before a spirit could associate with a body and the brain was enough of a transceiver or whatever. I don't know if that's true, but it's a fascinating idea. But suppose you create a, a complex enough physical substrate um, that now you have a vessel for consciousness. And now free-floating consciousness that's out there that might otherwise incarnate in a carbon-based body or be a hungry ghost or something may be like, wow, this vessel's available, I'll just enter this. And it may not be something that's, you know, determined by software, it may come in to that vessel with its own agenda and its own personality and who, who knows what. I mean, that's just an example of how um, there could be unintended consequences and that because these people don't respect or even acknowledge consciousness, they, they may never, um, the AA, AI may not emerge in their time scale or in the way that they think it will.
of a comment, I guess. Um, and I liked what you were discussing about the archetype of, as far as um, it's almost scariest as or, or devilish as we are progressing towards um, a major uh, breakthrough. And I think that's a, a good thing for people to probably hold in their own lives is when they're kind of coming to that breakthrough may look like the darkest time but it's something powerful is about to emerge, you know, and I think that's exactly. very helpful for... <coughs> yeah, a good metaphor for that is um, <coughs> the test pilot Chuck Yeager was the first man to break the sound barrier and it, it was the X-1 rocket plane or something and uh, nobody had ever done this before and they did, had no idea, you know, what would happen. And so as he started getting closer to the sound barrier, it felt like the plane was breaking up. It started to shake violently. And then there was this loud sonic boom. And he wasn't sure if the plane had exploded. And then everything just smooth sailing. Once he had broken through that barrier, mm -hmm. everything was on an even keel. So it, it can be like that um, where, you know, just like you're, you're you know, having a cardiac arrest and, you know, everything is in a state of red hot panic and pain. And then suddenly you're out of your body and like you're, you're more serene than you've ever been in your whole life. So it can sometimes be that way. Yes, sir. Uh, with Trump, at the time of the election, I was trying to think of what an archetype he would be. Right. And I was coming up with him as a big bad wolf from uh, the Three Little Pigs. Mm -hmm. Because as you saw him, he was going to be huffing and puffing in all the debates. Right. But also he knew the value of walls because mm. he had blown down the straw wall and blown down the wood wall, but knew the value of the brick wall. But he still had this other house he had to blow himself into, the White House. Yeah, well, no, it's um, interesting. Uh, I wonder if you uh, read any interviews from the, the, the ghostwriter who actually wrote The Art of the Deal, because when they, when they talked to that guy, I can't think of his name right now, uh, he said, well, um, Trump does have one ability, and this is exactly how he described it, almost word for word. He said, and, and that is he can really huff and puff and blow the house down that he's so overbearing and he just sort of wears people down with his, you know, vehemence and all that kind of stuff that he sort of gets his way. And what, what Trump has is um, many aspects of the trickster archetype. The trickster archetype is the archetype most associated with the paranormal. And um, so if you think about Steve Jobs, people would say that talk about um, his reality distortion fields. This is mentioned in the, the famous um, the most authoritative biography of him and in other places and was something that they got from Star Trek um, that, that he would tell engineers to do something that they would all say could not be done and then it would be done so the, through the power of his personality and will and you know he was a visionary genius but he was also a narcissistic personality disorder type not just narcissistic but like almost a psychopath in his coldness toward and manipulation of people um, and, and Trump seems to also be somebody who has the kind of charisma or personal power to generate a reality distortion field um, where very unexpected things seem to go his way. Um, and so the, the trickster, a friend of mine named George Hansen wrote an amazingly important book called The Trickster and the Paranormal. The trickster governs the paranormal because it, 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 it violates expected hierarchies and that's what Trump did. He, he was barely even a Republican. And he just swept in and like swept all these establishment forces aside. And, and when a society, when a system has become stagnant and is in decay, a trickster force may come in to, you know, turn over the stagnant apple cart. And um, uh, the, the, the trickster um, will often have uncanny charisma. And charisma is really a paranormal ability. And, and is not sufficiently appreciated or talked about. It can be quite dangerous. But, you know, many of the people who are in celebrity culture, people who turn out to be an epic movie star, um, they're not merely good looking or good actors. They may have off the charts charisma. Like Marilyn Monroe, you know, um, was a blonde bombshell, but those were a dime a dozen in Hollywood. But if you see her on the screen, she's incandescent. There is a power there. Um, that she may not understand or whatever, but but um, but it's this uncanny 
charisma effect. And so people with uncanny charisma, for, for good or ill, you know, it could be Rasputin, who had all kinds of um, paranormal reality bending, you know, effects, um, can come in when a system has become atrophied and lacking in vitality and kind of create this enormous disruption. And it's, it's needed to play the function of a shock. Um, I had a dream, I wrote an, another Reality Sandwich article about this on the morning of the inauguration that, that, you know, in which Trump was pictured as playing a kind of necessary role uh, for the collective unconscious because, you know, uh, shock is needed in an evolutionary system. You know, biology is called punctuated equilibrium. But in the ancient I Ching, 6,000 years old, shock is not just one of the 64 hexagrams, it's one of the eight trigrams that make up all hexagrams. You need shock to, to break down the homeostasis to create new form. And it will look terrible, um, but um, it is necessary uh, to create um, a, a quantum evolutionary shift. We got shock now. <laughs> right. <laughs> and when a shock occurs, the system will bifurcate. It will go higher or lower. We may not know which yet, but I have a feeling that it's um, serving a, uh, a purpose, a valuable purpose. Curious as to what archetype comes next. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know, but you know, um, you know, a lot of people make fun of the whole 2012 thing, and, and you know, um, terrible things were done with it. I happen to have a close friend who's unfortunately dying of stage four cancer right now, named John Major Jenkins, who wrote about 12 books about the Maya, and he was the one that you know discovered the whole galactic alignment thing. It was a very important archaeoastronomical discovery. And, you know, he never said anything unlike Terence McKenna or Jose Aguero, so anything dramatic would happen on that day. And there was no Mayan prophecy about anything happening on that day. Um, the calendar didn't end, it, like all calendars, it turns over. But a huge cycle ended. And there was um, some mythology about what would happen at this turning of the ages, that the Maya, you know, like many other cultures that, that had this perennial philosophy of a cycling of ages talked about. and, and they had a character, his name is escaping me right now, um, that was supposed to appear at that time, who'd be the, the vain, um, ego-glorious, you know, leader, who would be completely, you know, some kind of total false ego. And, uh, you know, at the time, John thought, like, wow, maybe George W. Bush was that. But, I mean, Donald Trump, I mean, you know, and I'm from New York City, so, like, I've hated Donald Trump since the 80s. I mean, to, to me, he was the figure, if you wanted, if, if you know, false ego were a term in the dictionary, and I went, if you asked me in 1988 to put a photo next to it, I would have put Donald Trump, who puts his name on towers and so forth. I mean, he's, he's like the emblem of everything that we're ready to transcend. But sometimes um, that which is most primitive and, and most associated with what we need to get out of will in fact become magnified near the cusp of an evolutionary process. So although we see this incredible advancement in the rights of women, and Leonard Schlein in The Alphabet versus the Goddess points out that the whole most modern, you know, not the suffragettes, but the most modern rise in the rights of women largely coincides with the rise of television. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we, and, and here we have this, you know, figure that represents, you know, everything on, on the other side of that. But at the same time that the rights of women around the whole planet are growing, um, is, m many uh, in Islamic culture have become far worse in their treatment of women than they ever were before. So it's almost like the group that is most counter-evolutionary will become exacerbated by sensing that the curve is moving away from them, and then that kind of riles them up to become more seventh century um, than they were before. So you get this paradoxical effect. And, and so my idea is that when we were hitting, going toward an evolutionary event horizon, novelty, as Whitehead and Terence McKenna talked about it, you know, the creation of new forms, it was also defined as density of interconnectedness, like in the human brain or in the internet, um, will increase. But as when novelty increases, my idea is that that means that the the outer edge of light and the outer edge of dark will both intensify. So the novelty is like the amplitude between those two poles. So you'll get 
Um, new forms of darkness never anticipated, new forms of light never anticipated, and that's what you'll probably find with these new technologies as well, that you'll have some people losing their lives into virtual reality and other people having you know, the equivalent of NDEs through the same technology. As Sophocles said, no great gift enters the human sphere without a curse attached. So we're going to find all these paradoxes of all these, you know, look at the explosion in gay rights, transgendered rights, the role of women, and then we get a Donald Trump instead of the least qualified man when the most qualified woman, you know, is defeated. So you just have these paradoxes um, occurring together. And, but evolution will work in this paradoxical way. I'll just give one more quick example. <clears throat> There is one man who um, um, promoted the evolution of the marijuana plant as a psychoactive medicine, a big industry here in Denver, um, more than any other, and spurred its evolution more than any other. Who is that man? Uh, well, and the, the, the answer is either Ronald Reagan or George Bush Sr., um, depending on which, which revved up the war on drugs more. Um, the, they closed off the border to Mexico as much as they could, so the cheap swag from brickweed from Mexico couldn't come in. They they created um, zero tolerance laws, and they, where they, the same penalty was applied based on weight or plant number, regardless of quality. So if you grew the super dank weed, you had a higher profit margin with the same risk, and they they created the economics of the homegrown industry because the cheap product from Mexico was not as available. So in their attempt to suppress the plant, they exponentiated its evolution as a psychoactive medicine. So evolution will often work in this paradoxical way where the uh, attempt to oppress something, uh, like it says in the I Ching, you know, some, some things will not fully blossom until they're fully oppressed. It's just like, you know, uh, except for the, you know, compression and, you know, heat and everything on a diamond for millions of years, I mean, on a car coal, or carbon, that's what creates a diamond. Um, it may take um, a powerful counter-evolutionary force to stimulate evolution. Can you, um, can you spend a minute or two talking about the ideographic representation of the spiral and why that's so important to you in your work? Well, I just sort of started noticing it in all these examples. And of course, you know, we have uh, the discovery in the 1950s by Crick and Watson of the, the DNA spiral. And so um, the spiral was already an evolutionary archetypal symbol. Um, but then we actually discovered that, well, that's true on the cellular level as well. And so uh, I think the idea is, one, another way of thinking about it is that you have like the circular time effect, the night turning into day, life and death, and it, you know, it, it, in many cultures it's just seen as this circle. But in the Western tradition, we have more of the linear view of history, and we also see like the progressive evolution. And I believe, and I talk about in, this, in the book, in teleological evolution, that evolution has a goal. It's not just, you know, a, a stumbling drunk, drunkard, you know, trendlessly fluctuating, as some modern evolutionary theorists think about it. Um, uh, D Charles Darwin was a believer in orthogenesis, and basically it's another way of saying teleological goal-oriented evolution. And so when you have this progression, now you combine the linear with the circle, and now you get the extended spiral leading you into another dimension. You still have the circular time, but there's also some kind of linear progression. So that's another idea. We Who might be ready. The person that you knew about in well? uh, John Major Jenkins. Um, uh, I just recorded, it's published on Reality Sandwich on my website, a, a, a pie of the hour, one sitting conversation with him, looking back on his life and work, you know, basically at the edge of the grave, probably. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, something that will relates to the near-death experience field uh, that many of you may have gone through is that, um, you know, a great bitterness that he has, you know, right up to the present day is that he was basically attacked from both sides. The, the um, academic Mayanists 
attacked him as an outside researcher making key discoveries in their field, um, you know, which totally pissed them off and, and, and not being as reductive as an approach. I mean, but he's understanding an ancient culture that were holistic in their approach. And then he also got attacked from the um, New Age lunatic types that wanted to make 2012 into their own bandwagon, like Jose Agueras, who like created this thing called Dream Spell, these fantastically complimentary types. Everybody, uh, you know, it, it would come up to me in festivals and be like, well, my Mayan, the Mayan calendar says I'm a purple wizard world bridger. <laughs> okay, well, but Dream Spell is not the Mayan calendar. It's, it's a totally different calendar. It doesn't match up with the dates. It doesn't account for leap years. It's not internally consistent. It has nothing to do with Mayan anything. This is just something that Jose invented. Um, and there were other people like Carl Coleman and others who, who came up with, you know, all kinds of nonsense about 2012. And so those people would then attack him as well. So if you're trying to do serious study with near-death experience, for example, the scientific community um, will dismiss you without having you know, a clue what they're talking about and say, oh, it's just an oxygen-starved brain. And, you know. Meanwhile, you know, an oxygen-starved brain doesn't form complex memories. I mean, it's disconfirmable by all kinds of, of stuff from the NDE literature. Um, but you may also get... Um, some people who just want to um, make it all uh, do a Christian evangelical thing about it and interpret it exclusively that way or want to um, bring in um, uh, a, a, you know, some kind of confabulated New Age version of it that, that lacks rigor. And so um, to try and walk between those two poles in this cultural divide is a very difficult thing. Twisting it some different way. Right. Well, maybe we're ready to cross the event horizon into the <laughs> rest of our evening. I don't know. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Thank you.